For motives and goals, uh, we're going to focus on a few concepts that um, A, I think are very important, um, and B, um, that often give students a little bit of difficulty in kind of keeping them straight. So we'll talk um, a little bit about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, which um, um, I think you might recall we talked about that briefly in the context of creativity. Um, we'll talk about uh, the distinction between self-regulation and self-control um, just very, very briefly um, to tell the difference between them. Um, self-control will come up a little bit later by itself. Um, the idea of highlighting and balancing goals. Um, and then um, finally, uh, we'll talk about self-control but I actually have to sneak in there a little bit before um, and tell you about um, a situation that's been going on in psychology um, for actually going, about, going on about five years now. Um, it feels kind of weird to call it a crisis if it's been going on for five years, um, but uh, we will talk about replication in psychology. So, um, here in our motives and goals module, um, we've got uh, the distinction between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Right? Um, so the idea here that um, it's really just about the process of pursuing this goal. Um, it's you know, the idea of having a fulfilling experience. Really, it's you're engaging in some behavior because you enjoy the behavior, right? Um, and that's contrasted with the idea of doing some behavior in order to get some kind of reward, right? Some kind of external benefit um, or also to avoid some kind of external punishment, right? Um, and you might remember um, back several weeks ago when we were talking about creativity and made the point um, that actually made two points that when you are trying to be creative if you can enjoy that process if you can do it for intrinsic motivation reasons you're more likely to be creative right um, and I also made the point that you're even uh, you're more likely to perform at a higher level, period, right? So again, the idea would be, imagine two students, um, they have equal abilities. Um, the one on the left says, I gotta make a million dollars before I turn 30. Um, so they're working really, really hard because they're extrinsically motivated. The one on the right says, boy, I just love to learn. I just love this process. Um, the student on the right does better, right? Because they are, motivated by that enjoyment. Um, and so they therefore become more likely to make that million dollars before they're 30, precisely because that's not what's motivating them. Okay, a um, couple things to keep in mind. Um, one, it's not all that simple. I mean, we do tend to engage in behaviors for a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation reasons. Um, but most people can kind of identify what's primary for them, what's really driving them more than anything else. Okay. Second, when you start to think about applying this to yourself, um, I want you to think about the most common mistake that students make with this. And that is, they say, um, hey, I'm going to school um, because of intrinsic motivation. I want to be a nurse someday. And I'm going to find it really, really fulfilling to be a nurse because I'll be able to uh, help people. That's not intrinsic motivation, right? It's intrinsic motivation being a nurse, but your motivation for school is extrinsic motivation because this, the external reward is your future career. Second, just a brief description of the uh, difference between self-regulation and self-control. Remember, we'll talk about self-control in a little bit more detail later. Um, but the thing to keep in mind now 
Um, this is something that students do sometimes uh, um, fail to keep straight. Self-regulation. Think of that as a very, very broad concept. You could almost imagine it being an alternative title for this whole module. Self-regulation you can think of as uh, basically everything that happens, everything that you do think um, when you are in pursuit of a goal. Right? So all the organization that you do, <clears throat> all of the uh, changes in your thought, all the changes in your behavior, everything that happens when you're in pursuit of a goal. Self-control is the very specific but very common situation in which you have something that you should do that will help you in the long term um, and then something that you want to do that you'll find much more enjoyable in the short term. Right? So maybe you have a paper due in two weeks, you know you should be working on that now, but you have friends inviting you um, to uh, um, play video games. All right, so what are you gonna choose to do um, in that conflict situation? Okay. So now, highlighting versus balancing based on progress or commitment. Uh, for this, I actually have some PowerPoint um, because I wanna give you a, a little bit of background about the organization of goals, um, both in terms of uh, networks um, and in terms of hierarchies. All right, so our goals are organized in kind of a network. They're kind of connected to each other. Okay, right? so this, for example, is uh, you know a simplified version of some of the major goals that I have. Um, as you may know, um, I do obstacle course races. Um, something pretty important to me. Um, I also do CrossFit. Obviously, I have a job here at College of DuPage. I have family relationships I'm trying to maintain, um, and then uh, some semblance of a, a social and leisure life. Um, um, yeah. um, and again, notice that they're connected, um, but those connections are not just random. Um, they um, kind of indicate the relationship between them. Right, so for example, if you look between OCR and CrossFit, there's a, po a positive sign in between them because they're kind of consistent with each other. Things that I do to become better at obstacle course racing are probably gonna make me better at CrossFit and vice versa. Uh, on the other hand, the relationship between um, OCR and my job at COD is basically negative. If I'm out there running, training to do an OCR, I'm not working on my classes, okay? Um, the other thing is note the sizes of the circles, um, kind of an indication of what I'm focusing on, um, what's in, kind of what's important to me. So I made OCR kind of big, made my family big, um, CrossFit not so big, um, and so on. So think of that as the network organization. I'll tell you about the hierarchical organization um, in a few minutes. You know, one thing you keep in mind is well, lots of things we could be working on, we really can only work on one. So look at the relationship between OCR and work, okay? Um, as I said a few minutes ago, if I'm out there running um, to get better at obstacle course racing, I am not sitting at my desk working on preparing lectures um, or grading or anything like that, okay? And so as part of self-regulation, right, um, we need to figure out what are we going to focus on, what are we going to do at any one time, okay? And that's this idea with highlighting and balancing um, and how it's related to commitment and progress, okay? A um, couple of definitions. We, when we say highlighting, we're just referring to the idea that I'm going to work on this goal. Right? It's important to me, so I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to focus on that specific goal for a while. Okay. If you balance, that means you're going to take this specific goal and say, okay, I'm, I'm done with it for now. Let me look at something else I can do. I'll balance it with an alternative, a different goal that I'm going to work on. Okay. Uh, and then here's the idea about hierarchies. You realize that 
the circles you saw on the previous slide, those are some main goals, right? Those main goals have kind of sub-goals underneath them. So for example, um, my major goal in obstacle course racing this year, assuming that these things are gonna happen, is there is a, uh, the OCR World Championships in October. I wanna finish in the top 10. Right. Well, there are sub goals along the way to that that are going to help me to get there. So, for example, there's a race in July in Chicago, a Savage Race. All right, I want to win that one um, in my age group. Okay. So, the idea is what's going to happen if I achieve my sub goal? Right? In other words, I go to Savage Race and I do get first place in the 55 to 59 age group. What's going to happen next? And that's the highlighting versus balancing. Okay. Am I going to work harder on it? Am I going to go back the very next day and start training again? That's highlighting. Or am I going to slack off and say, okay, I'm kind of done with OCR for a bit. Uh, let me focus on getting back to working on my classes or working, you know, improving relationships with my family members or some other goal that I have. Um, the answer to whether I'm going to highlight or balance is to a large degree a function of how do I interpret that savage race performance? Okay. Do I think of it as progress toward my overall goal or do I think of it as commitment? So imagine I think of it as commitment. Cross that finish line, first place, and I think to myself, wow, I really worked hard to get here it shows how important this goal of doing well at OCR is to me. I am really committed. I am likely to highlight that goal after thinking that way. I'm going to get right back out there and start training again as soon as I can. On the other hand, what if I think of it as progress? I say, wow, I did a great job here. I've really made a lot of progress toward my goal. Well, I feel like I'm kind of done for now so I can actually move on and balance and think about some other goal, right? So the idea again is if you have this intermediate success, this, this success on one of your sub goals, if you think of it as a sign of your commitment, you're likely to highlight that goal and work on it even more. If you think of it as a sign of progress, you're likely to stop working on that goal and start thinking about a different goal. So for example, imagine um, if we were meeting face to face, um, you have a class, that class has an exam. It's actually common that people don't show up on the day after an exam. Those are people who are probably balancing, right? They took the exam um, and they feel like, okay, I've made some progress here and now I better focus my attention somewhere else, okay? Um, interestingly enough, um, this is actually not in the textbook, but I, th I find this really pretty useful. Suppose you fail at the sub goal. So I go to the Savage Race and I don't even finish. I do really, really poorly. Okay? In that case, if I think of that as a sign of my commitment, gee, I guess I really didn't care about this that much. It's not that important to me. That's going to lead me to balance and not go back to training. On the other hand, if I think of it as, gee, I haven't made enough progress, I really didn't run enough, okay? That's gonna lead to highlighting. So after a success, commitment, interpreting it as, as commitment leads to highlighting, interpreting as progress leads to balancing. After a failure, interpreting it in terms of commitment leads to balancing, interpreting, interpreting it as a lack of progress leads to highlighting. Okay. So now, self-control in, in a few, um, but first let's talk about this replication crisis. You probably remember me saying, only one reason you're allowed to say something's true in psychology. Somebody did the research. Not just one somebody, lots of somebodies. That's the process of replication.
years ago, there began to be some rumblings in the field. Um, people were worried that we weren't replicating. Um, the concerns grew strong enough um, that a group of researchers decided to um, test us out a little bit. So they chose the year 2008. They selected three prestigious journals in psychology uh, and attempted to replicate uh, 100, 100 of the studies that were um, published in those three journals that year. Uh, and the results that they found were uh, sobering or terrifying, um, depending on how you want to look at it. Overall, only about a third of the studies were able to be replicated. Yeah. Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, were a quarter were replicated. This is the top journal in social psychology. Uh, you might remember I'm a cognitive psychologist, so people like me used to laugh at the uh, uh, social psychologists because we were twice as good as they were, but 50% is really not all that much to be uh, pleased with either. Um, this became known as the replication crisis. Now, you might think, whoa, 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 hold on here. Does this mean that two-thirds of the stuff that I've been reading about this semester is wrong? No, it doesn't mean that. Um, it doesn't even mean that two-thirds of the studies that were published in these journals was wrong. It does mean that there is a scientific controversy. It does mean that we need a third set of researchers to come along, and a fourth set, and a fifth set to come along and, until we can get an accumulation of research results that allow us to draw a solid conclusion. You see, that's the way science is supposed to work. Okay? Um, unfortunately, we hadn't been doing that. You might wonder, you know, what went wrong? Why did this happen? Why did we fail to do replications in psychology? Uh, I think actually one of the major reasons, if not the major reason, is that there was no incentive structure in place that rewarded replications. Uh, the huge, huge majority of research that's being conducted in psychology is conducted by uh, faculty members and graduate students at universities. Um, a faculty member at a university, they may teach some psychology classes, um, but their primary job is actually to conduct research. That's, how, that's why they were hired, and that's why they keep their jobs. At the end of six years, if you're an assistant professor, um, you're basically on probation for six years. At the end of six years, if you have built a body of research that consists of replications, you're out of a job. Okay? Um, you are evaluated on your original research. Nobody was getting or keeping jobs as, as a result of doing replications, therefore nobody did them. Okay? Well, now we know, hey, it's actually probably pretty important to do um, because it turns out now that we have focused more on replicating studies, what we find is that it's usually about 50% of the things that end up getting published in a journal end up being replicated um, by future researchers, by additional researchers. And, and again, that's the whole idea that I've been trying to uh, emphasize throughout the semester. Not just one somebody, we want lots of somebodies to have done the research. Um, why am I doing this now? Well, because obviously there's something related to self-control um, that's part of this replication crisis. Uh, it turns out, luckily enough, there's really not anything that we have covered so far that I need to go back um, and say, oh, we don't believe this anymore, um, um, except for one concept, and that is, uh, I forgot to check, but if there is still reference to uh, social priming effects, um, that's not a thing anymore. It used to be in the um, consciousness module. But let's think about 
self-control. Because the truth of the matter is, I'm not quite sure what I believe anymore about self-control. Remember the definition, you knew it already. It's also what we kind of think of as willpower um, in more uh, everyday conversation. Um, notice, there's one section here that's just kind of the definitions, and then there's a section on self-control as an innate ability in which they describe the very, very famous marshmallow challenge, um, which you might have even heard of before you took this class. Very famous study. Took a bunch of kids, brought them into a room. The room is empty. Hand the kid a marshmallow. Say, I gotta leave. But if you can wait and not eat this marshmallow, when I come back, I'll give you two marshmallows. And then they stay away for 15 minutes. As you might guess, some of the kids eat the marshmallow immediately. Some of the kids are able to wait. Um, and what the researchers found is that the kids who waited 10 years later did better on their SAT tests, right? M most, more successful in general, okay? Now, I'm not gonna say that this one didn't replicate, um, but something interesting was discovered when researchers tried to replicate it several years later um, with a much larger sample. Right? The original sample was pretty small. With a larger sample, the newer researchers were able to look at additional factors that might be related to people's success and what the right strategy is to do for the marshmallow. And that major factor is basically how much money does your family have? Right? Because the idea is that if you're poor, you're supposed to eat the marshmallow right away. Right? Because your life has basically told you that if you have food, you better eat it now because you don't know when you're gonna have food again. Right? The marshmallow might not be there 15 minutes from now if you don't eat it now. See, if you're rich, you can afford to wait because if the marshmallow is not there later, that's okay. When you get home, mommy and daddy will buy you a bag of marshmallows. Right. So the idea is that self-control, it's not that great thing. Right? It's not this thing that's going to be um, the correct strategy for everybody. So maybe this is not something that we should care about so much. Okay. Second, or really the third section, but the second kind of controversy, this idea that self-control might be a limited resource. Ego depletion is one of the most famous and one of the most important discoveries of the last 20 years-ish, a little bit longer. Um, the idea that if you use up your self-control in one area, you might not have enough left over in another area. So for example, in the famous first study, uh, researchers brought people into the lab and uh, you know, imagine an experiment. So we're gonna randomly divide them into two groups. Group one gets a bowl of cookies put in front of them, right? The other group gets a bowl of radishes put in front of them. And then they're told, you're not allowed to eat whatever's in front of you, right? Presumably it takes self-control to not eat the cookies. It doesn't take self-control to, to, to not eat the radishes, okay? And then they had them do something like work on an unsolvable puzzle after having resisted either the radishes or the cookies, the people who had to resist the cookies gave up on the puzzle sooner, right? They used up their self-control resisting the cookies. They didn't have any left over. Ego depletion has been replicated over 200 times. So how can I sit here and tell you that this is related to the replication crisis? No. Yeah. Well, a few minutes ago, I told you about a bias in the field. That is, nobody rewarded replications. There's another bias in the field, and that is journals didn't publish studies that don't work. All right, so the idea is that if you went out there and you tried to do this radish and cookie study, okay, 
and you get a significant difference between the radish group and the cookie group, yep, you're going to be able to publish that. But if you don't get a significant difference, right, there's no difference between your two groups, your study didn't work, a journal won't publish that. So what do you do? You file it away. Right, you, right, you kind of set it to the side and say, man, maybe I'll get back to it someday. It's called the file drawer effect. Right? The idea is that for any study that worked, that gets published, you have no idea how many people tried that study and didn't get it to work. So, researcher was working in ego depletion. He was having trouble getting his study to work. So he eventually began to suspect that there might be a little bit of a file drawer effect going on. So he contacted other researchers who worked in ego depletion and got them to contribute their unpublished results so that he could conduct a new meta-analysis. Meta-analyses had been done previously. You might remember a meta-analysis is where you take all of the studies in an area, you throw them together as if you've got one gigantic study. The meta-analyses that had been done previously included only the published work. When he threw in the unpublished work, in addition, the effect went away. So now what? Is this a thing? Is this not a thing? So ego depletion was subjected to um, a new effort called registered replication reports. Um, researchers decide on a study that needs to be replicated um, and then they assign that study to 25 different labs across the world, leading universities, you know, the top research uh, labs in the world. They all have the same procedure and they conduct the study and then you accept the results of those 25 labs and ego depletion lost. So on the basis of that, I gotta say, I don't think this should actually be in textbooks anymore. I do not believe that it is true. All right, so innate ability, maybe not important. Limited resource, maybe not true. What do I believe? Here's what I believe. People who look like they have self-control, they probably don't have any more self-control than, than the average person. What they do is they can structure their environment in such a way that they don't have the temptation. People look at me and they think that I have amazing self-control. I weigh the same that I, that, that I weighed in, in high school. Right? Um, terrific diet, um, exercise a lot, but I don't, I don't have particularly good self-control. Right? So if there's unhealthy sugary snacks lying around, I'll eat them. I just make sure that they're not lying around. For my last birthday, Somebody brought donuts to the gym. I don't know why she did that. It seems like a pretty bad place to serve donuts. Um, I took one of the donuts. I had to, I mean, it was for my birthday. Um, but as soon as everybody left, I threw the donut away. I didn't even take it home because I was afraid if I got it home, I would eat it and I didn't want to eat it, right? So that, if you want to have what we would call self-control, that's the type of strategies to try and adopt. Remove temptation before it even becomes a temptation. Okay, um, so that takes us to the end of the Motives and Goals module. i um, just make one quick point. These are the concepts that are kind of a combination of important and difficult. There are some other concepts that are important, um, but they're not that difficult, right? So the distinction between prevention and promotion uh, focus, for example, is generally very, very easy for people to keep straight. Um, so um, I will stop this here, and thanks for watching.